Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Wayne Al. I am uh, the Acting Dean of Diversity and Equity at the University of Washington Bothell, um, and I'm also a professor in the School of Educational Studies there. Um, and just by way of self-introduction, um, I've written a few books, uh, including a Marxist Education, and I've co-edited uh, a book, um, several books, including a, a Teaching for Black Lives and Rethinking Ethnic Studies, and I'm sort of just around and active as a, as a scholar activist um, uh, doing educational justice work. Uh, I want to just start by saying welcome to you all and just thank you all for being here tonight. And let me start this evening by thanking, of course, the Landon Foundation for making this event possible. I'm really honored to have been, yes, please, give it up for, for Landon. Uh, I'm honored to have been invited here to Santa Fe, my first time to Santa Fe, and uh, get the opportunity to hear from and have a, and hopefully a, a really good conversation uh, with the likes of, of Eve Ewing. Two pieces of business, though, before I start my introduction. Uh, one is that we ask that you refrain from filming or taking your own personal photographs with your phones or whatever. Um, and then the other piece is just to let you know that uh, both Eve and myself will be signing books after the event uh, out, out in the lobby, so that'll be going on out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, as you know, uh, it's my job tonight to introduce Eve Ewing. Now, truth be told, Eve and I don't really know each other, or at least didn't really know each other before tonight. Uh, this chance to introduce Eve kind of came out of the blue for me. Um, you know, I knew of Eve's excellent scholarly book entitled Ghosts in the Schoolyard, uh, which was based on her educational research on the school closings and the politics of race in the south side of Chicago. But I didn't know about the other stuff. And so I started poking around, learning more about Eve, only to find out that, my goodness, her other stuff was amazing. I began first by reading Eve's book of poetry and uh, pro prose, Electric Arches, and it totally blew me away. I loved it and I felt stupid for not reading it earlier. It is such a beautiful and moving collection. In Electric Arches, I see Eve processing so much about the politics of blackness, black childhood, Afrofuturism, education in this country, white supremacy, pop culture, family, teaching, there's just so much there. It's a monumental piece of work. And the language and imagery just sat with me in the most serious and best, way, and serious and best of ways. Um, I actually don't even have the words to adequately describe it. It's probably one of the reasons why I'm not a poet. And then, of course, I found out about Ironheart. And I was like, what? Eve Ewing is writing for Marvel? Like, for real? I mean, what education scholar does that, right? So I got my hands on as many issues of Ironheart as I could, and I read them with my nine-year-old son, Makoto, who's here in the audience today. And I want, you, I want you to understand the power of this, because it is emblematic of the power of Eve Ewing. My son and I got to sit down together and read a Marvel comic book about a brilliant young black woman superhero who was grounded in her community. And let me repeat that again for emphasis. My son and I got to sit down together and read a Marvel comic book about a brilliant young black woman superhero who was grounded in her community. You see, just by its very existence, Ironheart expands the conscious and unconscious worlds of our children, helping them to, to continue to see power and beauty in blackness. And Eve L. Ewing is helping to breathe life into that very project. Meanwhile, Eve's next to most recent book, 1919, dropped this last summer, and she immersed us in the, in the Chicago race riots of that same year, um, um, in, in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, she immersed us in the Chicago race riots of that same year, working through a historical document to explore the politics of race in Chicago and making connections with the city a hundred years later. It's, again, another amazing, uh, beautiful collection by Eve. All of which goes to explain why Ghosts in the Schoolyard is such a beautifully written piece of academic prose. Eve L. Ewing is an artist, and like all artists, she brings her full self to everything she does, including her academic research and writing. And to me, this is what I love about Eve Ewing and is what we should all love about Eve, I think. She utters such beauty and power into the world. But here I am gushing on and on about Eve's writing and I've gone and skipped the particulars. So in addition to being this incredible artistic and scholarly powerhouse, here are some other official things for you to know about Dr. Eve L. Ewing. She earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in English Language and Literature from the University of Chicago 
as well as earned a Master's of Arts in Teaching at Dominican University. Eve also earned her educational master's degree in education policy and management, as well as her educational doctorate in culture, communities, and education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Ewing taught in Chicago Public Schools, and she has also worked in several community-based and non-traditional educational settings. Currently, Dr. Ewing is an assistant professor in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, where she's also affiliated with both the university's Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, as well as the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. In addition to having published three books and worked on the Ironheart series in the last two years, two years? Eve Ewing has also co-written co a play entitled No Blue Memories, The Life and Times of Gwendolyn Brooks. She's also the host of a podcast called Bug House Square with Eve Ewing, has led a vigorous life on Twitter, <laughs> and co-directs an organization called Crescendo Literary. Uh, literary, which works with communities to use arts and education as a form of cultural organizing. I'm also happy to say that Eve's work has been getting much deserved recognition. She has received five honors or awards this year alone, including a 21st Century Award from the Chicago Public Library Foundation. And 2018 was no different for, for Eve either. Her five awards last year included Best Nonfiction Book from the prestigious Chicago Review of Books, the Alex Award from the American Library Association, and the Norma Faber, Farber First Book Award from the Poetry Society of America. And then in 2017, the year before, Eve Ewing earned the honor of having her book named as a top 10 book by both the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Public Library. And the Chicago Review of Books named Electric Arches as the best uh, book of poetry for that year. And so I'm gonna close my introduction with this. As I prepared for tonight's event, I approached several mutual friends and acquaintances that Eve and I have in common and just asked them about her. And their responses were unanimous in their praise. One said to me, oh, Eve, she's a real one. Another just said, she's straight fire. Others said beautiful or prolific or, oh my God, she's amazing. And so tonight, I think that we're gonna see all of that and more. So to all of you in the audience, it is my great honor tonight to introduce you to Dr. Eve L. Ewing. Good evening. How are you? Good. Um, I have, there are very high lights on me, so I can't see anyone. So I'm just going to pretend that I'm talking to an audience of ghosts, which will be very exciting and cool. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Please give it up for Wayne and that incredible introduction. Um, the thing that he may not know is that I'm, I'm like a longtime admirer of him and his work and, and look up to him so much and have for, for several years as a junior scholar of education. Um, his own scholarship is so amazing and inspiring and, and critically important. And so one of the fun things when people ask you to come speak somewhere and they say, who would you like to be in conversation with? You get to be aspirational, right? So I was like, I want to talk to Wayne. So I'm really grateful that he came to Santa Fe and agreed to be in conversation with me this evening. And also before we came out here, he was like, oh, I have to do an intro. What am I going to say? I don't know. And he was like jotting notes. And I was like, oh, this will be very casual. Um, and instead, I now feel very shy. Um, so thank you all. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really wonderful to be here in the beautiful Lensic Theater in Santa Fe, which is a city that I have an immense fondness for. As a Midwesterner, I'm extremely fascinated by the desert and by the, the ecosystem of the desert. And um, I've spent quite a bit of time here and, and just find it to be such a, a city of great kindness. So thank you for that. Thank you to everyone at the Landon Foundation, especially Program Director Jordan Abel for doing the, the very hard work to get me here um, and make sure that I'm fed and, and housed and all those things. And thank you to the Landon Foundation for everything that you've done as well to support my work and the work of, of so many authors. Um, please give them a round of applause. Um, before I formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we gather this evening on the occupied lands of many native peoples, including the Hikari Apache Nation and the Diné Nation. And of course, as you know, New Mexico is home to 19 Pueblo nations, which are some of the oldest tribal communities in what is currently known as the United States. 
And I want to express my gratitude for their stewardship of this land for generations and to remind us as we gather this evening to tell stories and share ideas that it is Native Heritage Month and it's really imperative that we remember the first peoples of this land and to make space for imagining a decolonized future. So thank you for that. So um, what I'm going to do with my time, I hope you like really sad, depressing poems. <laughs> hope you're into that. I'm a, happy, I'm a happy person. Yeah, shout out to that person. They're like, yes, love it. I'm a happy person who writes almost exclusively uh, very depressing things. Um, so you can, I pay for a therapist to help me figure that out. But if you have thoughts, I welcome them. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening is, is to read um, from my most recent book, 1919, which was also graciously supported by the Lannan Foundation, which is a supporter of, of my press, Haymarket Books, um, which published Electric Arches, my first book, as well as this most recent collection of poetry. So I'm going to read um, several poems from the book, and then um, Wayne is going to come back up and, and join me in conversation. Does that sound good? All right, sweet. Okay, so... Um, so, as, as Wayne mentioned, this book is in conversation uh, with an archival document that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, so, clap your hands if you have heard of the Red Summer. Okay. This is a benefit of being in the dark, because people are very honest. This is good. So we, this is a small minority of the crowd. Um, so in 1919, uh, the summer in the United States became known as the Red Summer. And that, that term was coined by James Walden Johnson, a famous poet and writer who also wrote the Black National Anthem. Um, and it became known as the Red Summer because throughout the summer of 1919, several extraordinarily violent race riots erupted across the United States. Um, these were very violent events that also preceded 1919 and continued past 1919. Um, if any of you have been watching Watchmen on HBO, which you should, um, you may have more recently learned about the Tulsa Massacre, which happened in 1921. So this was a very violent period in American race relations uh, for a number of reasons. One reason is that um, there was the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan that was happening during this time and, and an increase in lynchings across the United States. This was a time when Ida B. Wells was very active in trying to document that. And also, this was immediately after World War I. And so in World War I, uh, black soldiers had traveled across uh, the ocean to Europe and, and participated in World War I. And, oh, please turn your phone off, oh, unless you want me to answer it. I used to be a middle school teacher, and I did that once. I answered a kid's phone. That's not, that's always embarrassing. Um, more for the kid than for me. But anyway, so um, World War I had just happened and black soldiers had traveled across uh, the ocean and fought in Europe and they were told that they were fighting for freedom. They were fighting for the freedom of Europeans and the freedom of Americans and returned to the United States to see that under the regime of Jim Crow, they themselves were not entitled to those same freedoms. And so... On the one hand, you had black soldiers who had a new awareness of uh, their own kind of autonomy and their right to citizenship. And they would also come back and be decorated and wear their uniforms, which was um, very outrageous to many white people in the United States. The idea of a, of a black person in uniform was very offensive or shocking to them. And another thing that happened was the Great Migration, um, during which time thousands and thousands of black people left the agricultural South and moved to northern cities like Chicago. So during this time, um, as the Red Summer was happening, the race riot that happened in Chicago in 1919 was the most violent, uh, most deadly, and the longest of this series of riots. And I learned a little bit, I had learned a little bit about this race riot when I was younger, but most of what I, most of what I learned about it I came across while writing my second book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, that, that Wayne mentioned, um, when I was writing about the Great Migration. And I became very curious about why I did not know more about this event in my city's history, that the more I learned about it, the more I saw the parallels with the century in which we find ourselves now, and the more I became convinced that this event was a, a culminating seminal event in establishing racial boundaries that we now very much take for granted in cities like Chicago. So um, in 1922, a group of uh, people, there was a group of eight black men and eight white men, because women had not yet been invented in 1922, so, you know, it didn't exist. Uh, so a group of eight black men and eight white men came together and they, were, they formed a commission that was empowered by the governor of Illinois to, to do a report to try to figure out why had this race riot happened in 1919 in Chicago and how could it be prevented. So you can think of this kind of like the 9-11 commission, right? Something where a, a devastating violent event happens and a group of people come together and try to put together a research document to think how can we prevent this from ever happening again. And the report they put together was called The Negro in Chicago. 
excellent title, very descriptive, good title. And in this, in this report, they talked about the conditions of black people in Chicago during this time that led up to the riot and the, the relationships between black people and white people in Chicago that kind of set the context. And in the beginning of this document, the governor of Illinois wrote this preface where he said, if people just read this, this is in 1922, he said, if this document is so great, if people read it, we will never have any problems with racism in Chicago ever again. So I realized, like, oh, this is the problem. Nobody read it, right? And so that's why ah, nobody did the reading. And to be fair, this document is like 825 pages long, right? So um, I have sort of an obsessive personality. So I said, well, I'm going to read this entire thing from beginning to end. And I'm going to write a series of poems in conversation with this document. So that's what this book is. Um, that's a very long preamble. The document itself, if you're interested in archival research, is available in its entirety for free as a PDF on the internet. You can Google it and read it and learn more about the book. Um, and so what I'll read tonight, I'll read you several poems. And each poem is going to begin with an excerpt from this 1922 report, The Negro in Chicago. So I'll read the excerpt, and then I'll read the poem. And the book is divided into three sections, uh, before, during, during and after, um, kind of talking about the conditions uh, in Chicago before the riot happened, uh, talking about the events of the riot itself, and then the aftermath of the legacy. So um, I'm going to begin with a poem. This is a persona poem, meaning that it's written in the voice of another person or object. And <clears throat> pardon me, I forgot about the whole 7,200 feet elevation thing. So I'm like a desiccated corpse, basically. So I'm, I'll try not to. <laughs> cough into the microphone every 45 seconds. <laughs> if I keel over, avenge my death. OK. Um, so many of the black people who came up from, Chicago, from the South to cities like Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, New York, uh, right? Some of you maybe before this moment never thought about how black people got to these cities. or like, we just came out of the ground, right? But no, people came on trains. So they came on trains from the southern part of the United States um, and left jobs and sharecropping and other kinds of work to come north. So this poem is in the voice of a train carrying black people to Chicago during the Great Migration. It begins with this quote from the Negro in Chicago. The presence of Negroes in large numbers in our great cities is not a menace in itself. Good observation. <laughs> the train speaks. Even now, I dream of them quiet nights in the rail yard while the little rat feet skitter beneath me, when the last of the strong men with his gleaming silver buttons has locked the door and laid his hands against me. I see them dancing in every passing cloud. My babies, my babies. Born unto me in the hills and green lands, loose threads catching in my sharp parts when they don't watch out, blistered hands hauling parcels of burlap as hefty and shapeless as bound cotton. They move like rabbits then. They look for a lash that isn't there, even them that never felt it. It's in their shoulders. The lash lives in their shoulders. Long after the last biscuit is gone, when the sunrise brings steel mountains, my children look and look through the space I have made for them, the gift I have prepared. They are safe within but can see without. They feel it before they know the words, then smile when it comes to them. It's flat. The land is flat. And they smile to think of it, this new place the uncle or cousin who will greet them, the hat they will buy, the ribbons. They know not the cold, my babies. They know not the men who are waiting and angry. They know not that the absence of signs does not portend the absence of danger. My children, my precious ones, I can never take you home. You have none. And so you go out into the wind. Thank you. So during this time, during the Great Migration, uh, which is, by the way, one of the largest scale migration, migrations ever happened in the, in the history of, the, of human life, basically. It's a huge, giant uh, migration happened. And during this time, there was sort of a, a media war that was happening because um, white ruling class people, white uh, 
uh, farm owners and people in power in the South didn't want black people to leave the South, right? Because um, the system of kind of tenant farming and sharecropping was very economically beneficial to them. So it would be bad to lose their labor force. So black people were leaving in droves and they started passing laws in states like Alabama and Mississippi that labor recruiters couldn't be operating. And uh, the media became very important here because the Chicago Defender was a newspaper published in Chicago that would be distributed all across the South via Pullman porters. They would work on trains and they would secretly pass this newspaper among black people. And black people could get news of the North. And during this time, there were all these editorials in newspapers like The Defender, and they were saying, what are you doing down there? Come North, come live somewhere better, come do better, come get a better life. And at the same time, white owned newspapers would publish all these um, really scary stories about how if black people moved north they were going to face certain doom. And one of the things that they used, which to be fair is a reasonable fear tactic, was uh, the idea of cold. Um, that Chicago is very cold and if you move to Chicago you're going to freeze to death. And they would publish all these stories about like this black person, they left Alabama and they went to Chicago and they froze to death, right? That could be you, like don't leave, stay here and work on my farm and live in debt to me forever, right? And so um, this poem begins with an excerpt uh, from the Chicago Defender, um, which begins with the headline, Frozen Death Better. <laughs> to die from the bite of frost is far more glorious than that of the mob. I beg of you, my brothers, to leave that benighted land. You are free men. This poem is called In November. The first night I thought of my last night at home, of my uncle, like a fish on a line, mouth moving without speech, eyes like glass, shiny and dead, strung up on a tree they don't have here, where the winter, they told me, is death itself. Petrified men found on dirt frozen to rock. And maybe that will be me, a stone man, a tower of ash, needles where fingers were, and my eyes, too, gone to glass, found here this first night beneath a tree I have never seen, other men weeping in the dark, hearts broken at their belief that leaving the darkness meant finding the sun. But in the morning I rise, resurrected an angel of the hard black ground. Thank you. So nice how all these invisible ghosts in the audience are clapping. It's so great. Um, so this poem is called uh, Coming from the Stockyards. Um, and it's kind of a teacher poem. I was a teacher. I like to write teacher poems. It begins with this quotation from the Negro in Chicago. The change of home carried with it in many cases a change of status. The leader in a small southern community when he came to Chicago was immediately absorbed into the struggling mass of unnoticed workers. School teachers, male and female, whose positions in the South carried considerable prestige, had to go to work in factories and plants because the disparity in educational standards would not permit continuance of their profession in Chicago. This poem is called Coming from the Stockyards. Anytime I get on the streetcar with the blood of the steers blossoming across the front of my canvas pants, my clothes call cattle more than man. Not all the white men cringe, dressed as some are in the same rusting dullness and dread. Every one of us a hook, a slicing knife, a chain, a pile of awful. Forty dollars a week is worth the stain of death and the smell. Good men make more or less by whim. Each one of us a foundry, hands to cut, to carry, knees to bend. This is still new to me. I called myself a scholar in Georgia, though that was part fancy, just enough reading and writing to be of worth to my neighbors. Katie did people, summer song folk. They sent me the children after harvest. Loveliest were the days when we made the woods a grand schoolhouse, marching two by two to the creek to recite Wheatley or Dunbar. Naturalists, the lot of them calling out every tree by name, every fish. On the streetcar, I am lonely for them. Here, 
A white boy catches my glance, pulling his mother's sleeve and whispering loudly, what's he got? The question hangs ugly until I break its hold. I wave the book at him. Read this yet? His eyes drift over the red and the yellow and the brown of me. Smiling, he nods. His mother frowns, drawing him nearer. He speaks, that's Tarzan of the apes. My papa read it to me. He told me Tarzan is like. Under his mother's coat, he goes on, but his mouth is covered, voice muffled. And she looks out the window away from me. What a thing to be an invisible man seen only by a babe. I recall my old pupils. X is how they signed their name when they first came to me. To each I said, no, you have a name. And I wrote with them until they wrote alone. Zoetrope children, moving always and never. Zephyr children, wind of my heart. Thank you. So the, the race riot itself um, began in July, and it began um, at the beach. Um, and if you know the history of race in America, you know that uh, water and beaches and swimming pools are often very contested spaces where it's really important to enforce racial boundaries, maybe because people are like partially clothed or there's an intimacy to the, intimacy to the space. But for some reason, this has always been a point of contestation in American history. And so this day was no different. Um, Chicago, for those of you who don't know, abuts the beautiful Lake Michigan, and uh, very close to where I live, several blocks from my house. In 1919, uh, there was an informal rule that a certain part of the beach was for black people, and a certain part of the beach was for white people. Now, this was never the law. Chicago has never actually had de jure segregation, but has always had de facto segregation. And so there was, there was no rule, there was no law or anything enforcing this, but this was people's practice to have these two separate parts of the beach. Right, drawing an invisible line on something that should defy borders, a body of water. And so on a particularly hot day, a group of black teenagers was swimming on the black side. And one particular young man, his name was Eugene Williams, and he was 17 years old. And he was out in the water, and he found himself starting to drift, the wind starting to push him towards the white side of the beach. And he became very frightened, and on the shore he saw that people were throwing rocks. So there was a group of young white men throwing rocks into the water and trying to hit people. And it's unclear what happened next. Some people think that a rock actually hit him in the head. Um, it may also be that he was just too afraid to get out of the water. But regardless of the cause, what happened was that he drowned. He was hanging onto a railroad tie floating in the water, and he, he drowned and died. And everybody who was standing on the beach saw this happen. So they saw him drown, and um, they called a police officer and asked them to make an arrest and said this person was throwing rocks. The police officer refused to do so, and that was the beginning of the riot. Um, so this is a poem about the moment of Eugene Williams passing. The poem is called Jump Rope. <clears throat> it begins with this quotation from the Negro in Chicago. On Sunday, July 27, 1919, there was a clash of white people and Negroes at a bathing beach in Chicago, which resulted in the drowning of a Negro boy. Jump rope. Little Eugene, Jean, Jean, sweetest I've seen, seen, seen. His mama told him, him, them white boys mean, mean, mean. He didn't listen, listen, listen to what mama say, say, say. Went to the lake, lake, lake that July day, day, day. No, it goes like. Little Eugene W, so sorry to trouble you. Rise, Eugene, rise. Calm your mama's cries. Just sit up and look around. Don't let them bury you down. No, it goes like, down, down, baby, down, down, the water's tugging. Sweet, sweet, baby, don't make me let you go. Swallow, swallow, grab the sky. Swallow, swallow, dark. Swallow, swallow, grab the sky. Swallow, swallow, dark. Grandma, grandma, sick in bed. Call on Jesus, cause your babies. No, it goes like, all dressed in black, 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 all dressed in black, 
black, black, all dressed in. And he never came back, back, back. Thank you. Um, so throughout the, um, throughout the riots, there were groups of people that began to take kind of mob action. And the majority of the deaths that happened during this time happened through a series of random attacks. Um, and there were groups of young white men that were known as athletic clubs. Um, so they were basically street gangs. Um, great euphemism, though, athletic clubs. Um, and they would, they would grab random black people off of the streetcar or just walking down the street and assault them uh, or beat them to death. And what the authors who wrote The Negro in Chicago wrote is that sometimes people would get into this kind of mob frenzy and there would be people sort of on the periphery that the authors refer to them as sightseers and they, they would say that sometimes these people they were aiding and abetting the murder of a random person but they weren't consciously aware of what they were doing until it was all over they were just kind of on the fringe of this mob action so they say specifically quote often the sightseers and even those included in the nucleus did not know why they had taken part in crimes, the viciousness of which was not apparent to them until afterwards. This poem begins with a second quotation. The sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be good or evil. Hannah Arendt, uh, The Life of the Mind. This poem is called Sightseers. Just this once, I hope you'll forgive me for writing a somewhat didactic poem. I just didn't know how else to say that we live in a time of sightseers standing on the bridge of history, watching the water go by, and there are bodies in the water, and the water has been dirty for so long, and the sightseers still drink from it. They buy special filters, and they smile. They have nice glasses and teacups. They put sugar in the dirty water that has our bodies in it. And there are sightseers seated beneath the Tower of Empire, peering up at the lights. And there are children in the tower. And the tower has been crooked for so long. And the sightseers still look at it. They find the lights enchanting. They meet up on the weekends. They have picnics in the plaza of the tower that has our children in it. And there are sightseers looking at the House of Power, waiting to take a tour. And there are devils in the house and the house has been wicked for so long, and the sightseers still worship it. They stand in front and take pictures. They marvel at the white pillars. They send postcards of the house that has the devils in it. And just this once, I hope you'll forgive me for asking you directly to forget the lovely water, to forget the charming pillars, because there are children in the tower. There are children in the tower. There are children in the tower, and they are dead already. Thank you. I'm going to read um, three, or four more three or four more poems. You all have been delightful. Um, I wasn't going to read this one, but it seems sort of relevant to what I just talked about, so I will make a game time decision. Um, so the book of Exodus is um, very important for black people because the book, is, uh, the book of Exodus is about Moses leading people out of slavery, uh, which is kind of a thing we care about. And um, so it was very important for enslaved people to read this, this story and kind of make it their own. And a lot of black hymns and black spirituals are variations on things that happen in the book of Exodus. And, and during this time, during the Great Migration, the book of Exodus also started taking on this um, symbolic salience as well. And so uh, there are several poems, because people were thinking about this as basically an exodus from the south, right? People are partaking in this exodus from the south to the north. And so lots of headlines and media and poets and people were all writing about exodus. So several of the, books, uh, several of the poems in this book are these uh, versions of me basically rewriting these different verses from the book of Exodus to be about the events of the riot. Um, I'm not like really a, a Christian in a devout way, uh, but I do really like writing about the Bible. If you want to know more of an explanation of that, I have a, a essay in my first book called What I Talk About When I Talk About Black Jesus uh, that you can like read all about my thoughts on Jesus. But be that as it may, this is an Old Testament book. It's very like fire and brimstone. Um, so I'll read you one of the Exodus poems. It begins with two quotations. Uh, the first is about these athletic clubs that I've already told you about. Responsibility for many attacks 
was definitely placed by many witnesses upon the, quote, athletic clubs, including, they have great names, Reagan's Colts, the Hamburgers, Ale Words, Our Flag, The Standard, The Sparklers, and several others. The mobs were made up for the most part of boys between 15 and 22. The second quote is from a biography of Richard J. Daly, who was, uh, until his son succeeded him, was the longest serving mayor in, in uh, Chicago. Very powerful person. Daly was elected president of the Hamburg Athletic Club, AKA the Hamburgers, in 1922, sorry, 1924, at age 22, a post he held for the next 15 years. Daly always remained secretive about the riots and declined to respond to direct questions on the subject. That quotation is from American Pharaoh, the biography of Richard J. Daly by Adam Cohen, Elizabeth Taylor. Exodus 5. And afterward, the people went to the chambers of the Pharaoh and told him, thus saith the Lord God, the God of the prairie and the lake, God of the flatlands and the railroads, God of vice and of the disciple, God of the meat packer and God of the laundress, God of the lost child, let my people go, and they may hold a feast unto me in the bungalows. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let the people go? I know not your God, neither will I set you free. I am the one Pharaoh upon the land, and it is I who is Lord upon the flat land, Lord of the bridge and of the port, and the canal and the union, and all the streets which bear their names, Lord of the bootleg and Lord of brass. And they said unto Pharaoh, Our God hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, lest the Lord our God meet you with plague and pestilence or with the sword. And Pharaoh heard them not and sent them away, calling them idle. Then the Lord said unto the people, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. The Lord came unto Pharaoh in a dream and spoke to him, saying, Pharaoh, you have been wicked and denied my will. My people came to you as strangers in a strange land, and you denied them the land of their pilgrimage, and you have kept them in bondage. Now you will be punished for your cruelty and for casting upon them anguish of spirit. And Pharaoh lived many days under the watchful eye of the Lord God until a pestilence rose within him, a sour smoke choking him from within. And though he still appeared in the vestige of a man, a cloud moved into his spirit, and within he was no man but a plague, like rot on the silk of corn, a filth where sugar had been. Thank you. The Bible had bars. Just, I mean, regardless of your faith practices, you know, people who are writing religious texts, they were just mad about a lot of stuff. And they wanted to let you know that they were mad. Um, okay, I'll read you three more poems. Um, one is still within the kind of action of the riot itself, and then I'll read two that are about the legacy of the aftermath. This poem is called, This is a Map. It begins with this quotation. Samuel Bass, on account of the streetcar strike, was walking the five and one half miles from his work to his home when a gang of white men knocked him down three times and cut gashes in his nose and cheeks with their shoes. Bass hid behind freight cars till a Jewish peddler took him in his cart to State Street. A doctor was visited, but when he learned that Bass had no money, he turned him away without treatment, and he later died. This is a map. This is a map of my city. Here are the places in my city where I dare not go. Here is where the electric wires gave out, and here is where I still had to make it home. And here is the first mile where I whistled the way my granny taught me to keep away the haints. And here is where a baby waved to me from a window. And here is the second mile where I heard the calls and on this map, there is no third mile in this, my city, where I first prayed to die. And then, hearing a single cardinal over the din of their threats, changed my mind and prayed to live. 
And this is a map of my neighbor's city, where he traces a way through the mud each day, a squeal of old wood on iron heralding his arrival, a king of the streets, a conquering hero of nowhere. And this is a map of my body. This is the blood of my rivers. This is the bruise of my marshland. This is the sinew of my furthest ridge. And this is a map of the railroad. And if I could stand and walk, I could make it all the way back to my granny, pinching snuff and humming. And if she looked up, she would say, boy, my baby, where you been all this time? Thank you. So um, a recurring theme in, in my work, uh, poetry, comics, nonfiction, me yelling at people on the bus who don't know me, uh, whatever it is I'm doing, a recurring theme that I'm interested in, um, perhaps because I was a teacher, um, is how we decide which events in, Mer in American history take center stage and which are relegated to the margins or altogether forgotten. I'm very fascinated with this question because as, as we know and we've been told many times and we've seen many times, uh, the stories that get told are a reflection of narratives of, of dominance and narratives of power because one of the privileges of being in power is you get to decide which story really matters. Right? So one example I think about quite often is that the main line story about Thomas Jefferson is supposed to be that he was like an awesome dude, right? That he was a genius and he was a founding father, he's on money, there's a statue. Once you're on money, you've basically make, made it, right? Like Alexander Hamilton notwithstanding. His more recent success having perhaps resurrected his reputation. But prior to that, didn't none of y'all know who Alexander Hamilton was? Unless you took like AP, you know, history or something. Anyway. The mainline story about Thomas Jefferson is supposed to be that he was awesome, right? And then the story about him owning slaves or, in fact, being one of the most innovative people during his time to invent ways of erasing the labor of his slaves, right? Thomas Jefferson was one of the people who pioneered the dumbwaiter, which is a way of pretending that food just comes out of nowhere, that no hands prepared it, right? So those stories, his relationship with Sally Hemings, all those things are either altogether forgotten by most people or they're considered to be marginal, they're considered to be footnotes, right? They're like the extra stuff that maybe if you have time you get to it. To someone like me, those stories are actually the most important part, right? Thomas Jefferson famously said in notes on the state of Virginia that black people were biologically incapable of writing poetry. To me, that's kind of like the main story, but <laughs> that's my personal self-interest. Right? But who gets to decide? So that's a recurring theme in my work, and it's, it's certainly very salient in this book. And so in the, la in the last part of the book, I wanted to think about the legacy of, of 1919, why it is that some stories and some histories are forgotten and some are not. And one forgotten history uh, that I think about a lot also took place in Chicago in July. And that was um, in 1995, there was a heat wave in Chicago that killed 739 people. And the majority of the people who died in that heat wave were, uh, many of them were black, many of them were low income, and many of them were elderly um, because they were living in uh, very constrained public housing and high rise apartments that didn't have adequate ventilation, they didn't have air conditioning. And so them dying in this heat wave wasn't really a natural event. It was um, something that God did, something natural, something random, interacting with things that humans did. And we see that in Hurricane Katrina. We see that with Hurricane Maria, right? Things that are random acts of God interact with the human systems of inequality that amplify harm. And as we think about the climate crisis, this is something I think is really critical for us to continue contending with, which is that once we are all in crisis, Earth-made crisis, human-made crisis, that doesn't erase the schisms that already exist or the hierarchies that we've already built. It amplifies them. So the only reason I know anything about the heat wave in 1995 is because I remember it actually happening. And it's not like a historical event that people really talk about, and I don't, I don't really get why. So I wrote this poem about that. It's called July, July, in remembrance of the 739 people who lost their lives that week in 1995. One summer in Chicago, the people baked to death in brick, mouths open for water, or to say, my Lord, or to say, I love you, mama, or to sing, or their eyes closed and they died in their sleep, sweat spelling the shape of an angel against floral patterns, spilling into the quilted stitching a new map, not just one river, but many, tracing an X and an X and another, full of salt water like the coasts we never met. That summer, 
Or maybe it was the summer before, or another summer, or every summer, we lay on our backs, the one good comforter protecting us from the nails and staples in the floorboards that would have etched their little brands into our still baby skin, metal pressing through my thin cotton undershirt like a toothache. In my pillowcase, I hid books and used Kleenex. Each night, I listened to my brother wheeze. I prayed for rain to come. I said, I love you. I didn't say, it's too hot to breathe right. I said, good night. I didn't say whether I would give up or not. I said, this is still home. I said, my Lord. Thank you. Uh, you all have been just delightful, and I'm really eager to see your faces and uh, also to be in conversation with Wayne. So I'm going to read you one final poem, and thank you so much again. Um, and we will be signing books afterwards, so hopefully we can, we can chat. Um, also, by the way, if there are any educators in the audience, there is a free teaching guide that goes along with this book that you can, or just people who like to read PDFs that are free, um, who are not educators. Um, you can go to haymarketbooks.org and find the page uh, for this book. You can search my name or search 1919 and scroll down and there's a free downloadable teacher's guide that I collaborated with, with another teacher on um, and we're really proud of it and so please check that out if, that, uh, if you are compelled to do so. Um, yay! Yeah, you're welcome! Yeah, I too was a teacher hustling for free things. Um, so this final poem um, is about Emmett Till, um, who, like Eugene Williams, uh, was a black teenage boy from Chicago who found his life ended far too early um, through acts of racist violence. And, you know, the thing about Emmett Till is um, that a couple summers ago, it was, it was around his birthday, and I read an article about his cousin, Simeon Wright. And Simeon Wright was with Emmett Till the night he was kidnapped. Um, and he was a witness in the case against his murderers. And Simeon Wright, um, once, he, once everything horrible happened in his life and he went through this traumatic experience, he went on to live a pretty long and boring life. He, I think he was like in the pipe fitters union. He was like a regular working guy. He moved to the suburbs. He had a couple of kids. And he passed away in his 70s. And he just had like a regular boring life. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe Emmett Till, if he had not been brutally murdered as a teenager, maybe he would have gone on to be famous. Like, maybe he would have been a famous attorney or an astronaut or a director. But maybe he also would have just had, like, a boring, regular life. And there's something radical in the demand that black people be allowed to just, like, live a regular, banal, mediocre life. That's the ask. That's what, bra that's what Black Lives Matter means. It just means, like, we just want to be regular and just alive. That's it. That's the ask, right? It's, like, not that serious. Um, and one of the things I love about poetry is that I can create the world that I want to see and put it forth as a model or a prototype, and it doesn't cost me anything. It's totally free. I don't have to pass a law or, like, raise a tax or advocate for a policy or do anything. I just write the poem. And so I decided to write a poem in which Emmett Till uh, didn't die a young man and instead lived a very long, boring life. Um, and this poem, in this poem, I run into him. Um, any Chicagoans in the audience? Yeah, okay, shout out to that person. So this poem takes place in Jewel, for that person. It's like Kroger, Safeway, Stop and Shop, insert your local situation here. Not Trader Joe's. This is like run-of-the-mill <laughs> grocery store, okay. This poem is called, I Saw Emmett Till This Week at the Grocery Store. It begins with this quotation from the Negro in Chicago, which I remind you is written in 1922. They said, there is no time to be lost. Other matters must be put aside for the moment and a solution reached for Chicago's greatest problem. I saw Emmett Till this week at the grocery store. Looking over the plums, one by one, lifting each to his eyes and turning it over slowly, a little earth, checking the smooth skin for pockmarks and rot or signs of unkind days or people then sliding them gently into the plastic, whistling softly, reaching with a slim woolen arm into the cart, he first balanced them over the wire before realizing the danger of bruising, then lifting them back out, cradling them in the crook of his elbow until something harder could take that bottom space. 
I knew him from his hat. One of those fine pork pie numbers they used to sell on Roosevelt Road. It had lost its feather, but he had carefully folded a dollar bill and slid it between the ribbon and the felt, and it stood at attention. He wore his money. Upright and strong, he was already to the checkout by the time I caught up with him. I called out his name, and he spun like a dancer, candy bar in hand, looked at me quizzically for a moment before remembering my face. Well, hello, young lady. Hello, so chilly today. I should have worn my warm coat like you. Yes, so cool for August in Chicago. How are things going for you? Oh, he sighed and put the candy on the belt. It goes, it goes. Thank you all so very much. I'm so grateful for your time. And I'll be right back. 